Okay, thank you very much uh, and for the invitation to talk. I will not be talking about community detection, although I, I could talk about that, but I, I will not talk about, uh, about something entirely different. Uh, right, okay. Uh, so let's just get started. Uh, the uh, type of problem we'll be thinking about now uh, usually is the type of statistical problems. Uh, and they're usually known as property testing or estimation in the uh, C CS theory community. Uh, and the problem is of the following form. I have samples drawn from some discrete distributions, and I want to learn certain properties of the distribution, either through making a test or some confidence interval statement or make an estimate. Yes? Okay, so the, the only example I will mention today, uh, well, maybe I mean, a major example, is estimate uh, the, the, the unseen. So this is usually known as uh, called this problem. And uh, what it really does is to estimate the cardinality of the support of the distribution. So, uh, and that is, uh, okay. so that is the number of non-zero masses in a given distribution. And I want to know this quantity, this integer, through repeated draws from this distribution. And one example is, for this guy, you have five non-zero masses, yes? And uh, apparently, this is exactly equivalent to estimating number of unobserved symbols, because I can, whatever I have saw, uh, have seen so far, plus those I have never been able to see it, is exactly the total population size, right? Okay. Uh, okay, so let's review some classical results. So this is probably the oldest problem in statistics. I mean, if you think about it, you don't need to know Gaussians. You know, probably the Egyptians have started it, but there's no paper. Uh, but the, one of the earliest examples, uh, well, I think it's one of the favorite examples of Alon, is you know, the paper by Fisher et al. Uh, okay, so Fisher plus two experimentalists. So um, they went to some expedition to some island, and they were there for two years trapping the butterflies, and they want to know how many are there. So I have all these things I observed, but there must be more, right? So the, you cannot re resist the attempt to say there might be more. So you need to guess those things you haven't seen. And uh, also, in addition to study of uh, animals, and the study of language, and the study of coins, um, one of the uh, iconic example is how many words does Shakespeare know? Or did Shakespeare know? If I give you all the uh, the plays he have written, you want to guess what is his vocabulary size, including those words he ever got the chance to use. Right? So it's a, it's a nice thing. And I will not discuss uh, probability estimation. That is to estimate what's the chance that the next symbol is new. Right? So that's. Uh, go Turing and uh, along the uh, long sequence of work along these type of problems, there are connections, but I will not discuss that. Okay, so let's go to mathematics. So uh, the samples I will denote by x1 to xn. They are in the simplest uh, ID case are drawn from this distribution p, and I want to come up with some estimate which is measurable to my data to close to the true support size, either in probability or in expectation. Right? I want to do this with the minimum sample size as possible. In other words, I want to find the statistical limit of, uh, the, of this problem. And also, I want to have a fast procedure that <coughs> achieves it. Right? So this is uh, what I'm hoping for. And, and if you think about it, of course, now you need to assume something about the distribution. You have to assume something about, because I can put a tiny mass somewhere. I can put a lot of tiny mass somewhere. You will never be able to see it, right? So you will, you will suffer a huge loss. So you need to assume something about non-zero mass that has to be bigger than something. This is exactly the same as in estimating the support of a sparse vector in noise. You need to assume the non-zero exceeds the, the root log p, right? The, the fluctuation of the noise, right? It's the same idea. Right, so let's, the, co the conventional assumption is to assume distributions, uh, the minimum mass is at least 1 over k. And let's call all these distributions d of k. And uh, implicitly, the alphabet size right, is, is, is also at most k. Uh, but I want to know the support, right, the no number of non-zeros. And uh, let me just formally define com sample complexity of this problem as, let me just read it, is the minimum sample size for which you can come up with estimate to get within the truth plus minus epsilon times k with probability at least 1 half. So this is my error, epsilon k. Uh, I just put something here because you will see that naturally, the, because this, this uh, support size itself 
typically will be large, right? like half of k, or I don't know, k divided by root k. Uh, so the error will be also proportional to k, but this is just a reparameterization. And uh, I want to, this to hold for any such distributions. And two very quick remarks. The, uh, I just put one half here, just for convenience. If I want to upgrade my confidence from one half to, let's say, one minus one over 10 to the minus five, I only need to do the following, the, the classical procedures. I need to oversample log one over delta. And uh, what I need to do is to cut the samples and apply the same procedure and take the medium and use Hofstein. That's it, exponential concentration. So it's, uh, it's very simple. So let's just focus on this, just for simplicity. Another th trivial case is if I want exactly a zero error, right? I want with high probability my estimate is going to be exactly equal to that, and you will see very simple, this is exactly the coupon collector problem. You need k log k, right, so if for this to happen. But if I can tolerate a little bit of error, right, maybe I can do better. And uh, indeed, what would, would uh, anyone do? What would be the Egyptians' uh, approach, right? So I will just take uh, whatever I have seen so far, so what I see is what I estimate. So this is what, this is what, uh, what people do. Uh, you can also interpret it as the plug-in, right? So I take the empirical distribution, I compute its support size, and declare that as my estimate. And uh, this is obviously underestimate, and is usually grossly underestimate the truth in the interesting sublinear uh, sampling regime, where you do not have a lot of samples, right? You, but you could have a huge uh, alphabet. Okay, so this is not going to cut it, but the rationale behind uh, the seeing estimator is I'm trying to estimate distribution itself, then plug it, plug it in, right? So uh, it's, it's actually not a good idea to, to estimate distribution itself because this is a humongous high dimensional object for which probably you need a linear, right? Up to k samples. And you can do no better than empirical distribution. But in this type of situations, you only care about one number. So it's not entirely unthinkable that you can do better. Right, little of k, but I can also give you examples where even if you want to estimate one function, you need exactly the same number of samples. But in this case, maybe you can do sublinear. Right? It's, it's not so clear. Okay, so let's let's go a little bit deeper into this. Uh, so the sufficient statistic for this problem is obviously first thing you can think is the histogram, number of occurrences of the J symbol. Right, so this is uh, obvious. But then. In fact, because the quantity you want to estimate is permutation invariant, so the histogram of the histogram is in fact also sufficient. You can further summarize histogram by its own histogram. So this is what usually people call fingerprints of profiles. That's the number of symbols that exactly occurred once, twice, three times worse. If I give you this, you can do whatever you can uh, as if you have the raw data, right? So this is uh, what sufficiency means in this case. Uh, and H0 is precisely number of unobserved guys. I, 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 this is not computable. Okay, so what do people do beyond uh, the, uh, the naive approach? Well, uh, so a lot of uh, popular approaches falls under the category of linear estimators. Linear in what? Linear in the fingerprints. So one way to, ask to, to uh, understand uh, what we're doing here is I have some function which apply to every histogram, and I just add it up. Equivalently, I can write it as a linear combination of the fingerprints, right? It's just a different uh, way to, to do the bookkeeping. And the uh, plug-in, the number of things is precisely the things I see once, twice, three times, four. So just, and it's a linear combination with all one coefficient. Okay, so what, uh, what's, what, what is usually better? It's some uh, uh, other things. Now you see this is crazy. So what, what we're doing now is I, if I see something once, I add something. If I see something twice, I subtract something. And I add more, and I subtract more. And actually it works very well. Uh, and there is a lot of interpretations of this procedure. And also there is another uh, one, I think I'm from CISO, uh, is that uh, attributed to Fisher is some Bayesian uh, estimators from some gamma priors. And they also of this form, but they want to kill the oscillations by adding some binomial tails, right? So it grows and then dies. Okay, so it's all of this. Sorry? Hmm? You need T2B less than 1. Here? Yeah, all probably the second one. Uh, sec uh, second one, I mean, you can, you can take T equal to 10 to run it. Because you probably get minus uh, 2,000 or something, but. You may not be able to show something. 
I don't think there is anything they proved here. So, but all these are, uh, let's say, do not have very strong provable result. Okay, so, so what do we know, provably? Uh, well, we can prove very easily that if you just estimate by what you saw, and then the sample complexity is at most k times log one over epsilon. So this is not going to be sublinear in the in k. Uh, but the dependence on the error is log 1 over epsilon, right? It's exponential concentration. It's not so bad. Okay, it's not so good. Okay, so there, there is a sequence of results which showed that sublinear is possible. Um, so a Paul Valiant and uh, Greg Valiant in the audience and uh, uh, another group of people. Uh, so essentially what they showed is that using linear programming, which is roughly the same procedure in Ephron sees that, but they did the exact uh, rigorous analysis that you can do with sublinear. So it's k over log k, so it's li actually little of k now. But the dependence on epsilon is 1 over epsilon square. Right? So, and there is also a lower bound, but there is no explicit dependence on, on the error. But you know the k over log k is, is the correct scaling. So what I will show you is that actually you can get the, the best of the both, uh, roughly speaking. So you can get sublinear k over log k. And the dependence, instead of 1 over epsilon square, which is polynomial, you get polylogarithmic. So it's log square of 1 over epsilon. So if you think about it, this is actually sub-exponential uh, concentration. The tail is like e to the minus square root of something. And, and indeed, uh, if, you, if you refuse to look at sample complexity and look at minimax risk, uh, you can prove essentially the, the term that gives you square root of log is exponential square root of Okay, so we, uh, so we, we, I, I will show you uh, essentially the, the positive result for this loss and the negative result for 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 the, for the, the previous zero one loss. But anyways, uh, yes. So that's what I'll do in the remainder of the talk. Uh, how many times do I have? Okay. Right. So uh, so what's uh, a principled way to design? Uh, Estimator, which turns out to be linear and with uh, provable optimality, and also very natural lower bound to, to prove uh, impossibility result through a duality argument. Okay, so a little bit of uh, uh, background. I will be very quick here. So you can define a best polynomial approximation for some function on a given finite interval as simply the best approximation to this function under L infinity norm, right? So, and you know by the denseness of polynomials. You can approximate a continuous function very well if you have very large degree in the in the in the polynomial, and uh, how fast usually depends on how smooth the function is, and also you can view it, view the best uh, error as a finite dimensional convex programming, right? The infinite norm is is convex, and also in infinite dimensional linear programming. So this is this view is important. Uh, why? Uh, okay, so this is just exa some examples. Uh, right, I want to look at the dual of this problem. The deal of this problem is precisely the following. Uh, I call it moment matching. So the idea is you're doing the following optimization problem. You want to pick two random variables so that their moment match 1, 2, 3, 4 up to some L. But their expectation under this given function differs as much as possible. Right? So there is, some, of course, some tension between the objective and your constraint. Because if F is very smooth, if you just do the Taylor expansion, the first L term is going to be annihilated. So this is not going to be very, very big. And you have to pick it very carefully. And uh, of course, the optimization now is not over random variables, it's over its law. Uh, but I will just write in this style of notations. Okay, so, and uh, this problem is over probability measures. But you only have finite number of constraint. So if we attach each uh, dual variable to this and compute its, uh, its dual program, and you will see that's precisely the best, pros, uh, linear, uh, best polynomial approximation. And the row of the dual variable plays the coefficient uh, of the polynomials. Right? So, and you can show there is no duality gap. There are many methods to do this. And usually, the random variable looks like this, but it's not important. OK, so let me say something about the optimal procedure. Uh, first, the uh, simplification you can do is to personalize your sampling model. So instead of draw fixed uh, n samples, let me draw a Poisson. Uh, number of samples with mean n, and then draw samples. Then what the, the benefits of this is that, A, it uh, 
makes the histograms independent now. So it's independent, no identical Poisson random variables, and it only affects all these statistical limits that you're looking for by constant factors. So that is a good, good plus. And uh, the main problem with the usual naive approach is his huge bias. So let's look at if we can do unbiased estimators. Of course not, because anything that you can estimate without any bias is either polynomials if without Poisson sampling or analytic functions if you have Poisson samplings, right? So, so this, this garbage is, is not even continuous. Of course, there is no way to, to estimate without any bias. So, but the idea is that maybe we can approximate it by some... This is continuous because you made the assumption that all of the non-zero entries are more than one, one over right, k. Right, but there's... Why does one make a little slope of one over k, right? Uh, yes, for example, that you see. <laughs> yes, so you will see that... Uh, uh, but but you, can, you cannot make it... Uh, you cannot make it, never make it analytic, right? Because you have... If, if you can... There's a constant function. If you, con if you coincide on any open interval, right, you're going to be a whole thing is flat. Okay, so there is, yeah, so you agree. even if you do that, there is no way to have zero bias. Uh, but maybe you can approximate it by something you can estimate unbiasedly and then do that, right? But uh, this is roughly the idea, but uh, to execute this plan, uh, we can do it a little bit uh, differently. Okay, so, so we're going to design some linear estimators. So I have some intuition of how to pick these coefficients. My intuition is the following. If I haven't seen anything, I shouldn't, I should shut up, right? I, should, I shouldn't say it's actually, I should add two, so that's stupid. Uh, if it has appeared, let's say, a million times in two million samples, what do I know? I know that guy is in the alphabet, and I know the mass is probably one half, and I shouldn't say anything else. It's only for those guys who appeared once or twice that I probably, that I have, I have the intuition that there are probably small masses there who didn't get to show up, but I need to correct for that, right? So that's, so if I, you know, pick zero here and all ones over there, my, I'm left over with picking this coefficient in the middle, right? So that's the, that's the meat. Okay, so how do I do it? Uh, right? Well, actually, I didn't do anything. If, if, you, if you just write out the, the bias, uh, what you can notice here, this, is, this term is precisely a polynomial of degree L. This is where I cut. So, so I omitted a bunch of details, but uh, as you can see, this function here is some small exponential times the polynomial of degree L. And uh, the, the, now the thing that you need to do is to pick a polynomial of degree L that passes through minus 1 and oscillate, deviate from 0 a little bit. Right? So you want to optimize this scheme. And it turns out the solution is exactly the Chebyshev polynomial. So the, the picture for this is that's as Ramon said. This is my step function. The thing that, I, and I know here is forbidden, right? There is no mass here between zero and one over k. But I, but I want to design some guy that passes through here, and and between in this gray region, I, I suffer nothing because there is no mass. But here I want to just oscillate, you know, a little bit. And this is given a budget on the degree, and this is exactly given by Chebyshev polynomial. Now I can find my procedure, which is simply looking at a shifted version of Chebyshev polynomial and compute its, its coefficient, and that's it. And uh, sure. And here, you see, I do not even need to split the samples. So I can do it as a, because the usual approach is to see, OK, where should I plug in? For big mass, I plug in. For small mass, I do some, some of this stuff. But here, I just do it, did it in one shot. So there is no need to, to do these uh, <coughs> things. And also, it's, of course, it's faster than linear programming, and it's not surprising. And uh, okay, so where does the square root of exponential comes? It comes from the just the small expansion of the cosines, and the variance is actually a smaller term. And uh, if you look at the coefficient that computed from the Chebyshev polynomial, it's very similar to Efron that It start to grow and then start and then and died. So, but I have I have no explanation of why you need to have you know, alternating signs and also these fluctuations. I have no uh, intuition from first principles. Yes, in hindsight, it's optimal, but uh, why does it help? It's, it's very mysterious to me. Uh, okay, so I want to say a little bit about the impossibility result. Uh, all right, let me just jump to the, uh, the main idea. So the idea is to, is to pick two random distributions. 
and, uh, and draw realizations from the distributions. So I have distribution over distributions. And then draw the samples, for example, sufficient statistics. And the goal is to confuse the statisticians. Right? So if they have very different spore size, but from the data I cannot tell which ensemble they are from, then I'm screwed. So this is the main idea. But it's difficult to implement this plan is because uh, if you think about the random distribution, of course these entries are coupled because they normalize. Yes. So, so this is some Poisson, very high dimensional Poisson mixtures. It's not very easy to compute distance. But the key construction is the following. Suppose I have some random variable with unit mean. I can populate a distribution with its identical copies. Of course now I will not get exact distributions. Right? So I will, the, this guy will not be supported on the probability simplex, but it will just be a little bit fuzzy around the probability simplex because of lower of large numbers. And I can do the same thing for the other guy. And the, and the, the benefits of this approach is that, aha, now I can use some very you know, simple argument to show that, yes, I can take this essentially as my probability distribution. So they are closed, but they are not, but it's fine. But now the support size concentrates. Why? Because how many non-zeros are in this distribution? Just the k times the probability of non-zero mass. I put that here. And the same for that. So I need to separate this, and uh, the sufficient statistics now become ID. So this is this is the the benefits. Then for product distributions, I only need to treat them as one dimensions and prove that marginals are close. So this is essentially reduce the problem from k dimensions to one dimensions. And the good sufficient condition to ensure they are close is that they have the same moments for, for a lot of uh, things. OK, so the program I'm, I'm going to solve now is the following. So I have this recipe to generate uh, to, uh, a lower bound, right? So I want to pick uh, two random variables. So think about this as a mother of distributions. You, pick, you generate distribution like this. And uh, when I, whenever the constraint are satisfied, the statisticians is going to be confused, right? And this is the loss you suffer. So I want to maximize the suffering subject to this constraint. And this problem, there is a, it's dangerously close to moment matching, but there is something different. First, this is not a very smooth function. And second, I need some hard constraint on the, on the, on the mean. But fortunately, in this problem, you can solve it exactly. You can do some ch change of measures. And you can find out it's actually exact approximation of 1 over x function for which the solution is also some Chebyshev in disguise. And you have the same score root in the exponentials. And that's why you have the exact. I should mention that uh, the main inspiration of this, the idea of looking at the polynomials and the moments, uh, are inspired by earlier work of in Gaussian models, in particular, uh, Nemirovsky and uh, Tonikaya here, the authors in these papers. Uh, so, but here there is something a little bit different with probabilities, and also the compared to the previous breakthrough result in valiant valiant, and uh, the the main difficulty there, at least in the lower bound, is deal with large, is very high dimensional distributions. <coughs> um, but here, essentially, you have a, a small argument, just make it reduced to one dimension. So this is like singularization, right? Uh, right. So experiments. Yeah. Okay. I will mention a little bit about Shakespeare. I just stop here. Uh, so this is linear programming, and this is uh, you know this Chebyshev with degree ten, and uh, they roughly behave something like the same. Yes. So this is I give you some passage of Hamlet, and you guess how many words are there. Okay. Uh, I just want to say one last thing before. Okay. Uh, there is a very uh, closely related problem, which is like a sub-problem of this. It's called species problem. And uh, one way to formulate it is to have an urn of k balls of some color, right? Some same color, uh, and you want to estimate how many colors are there in the ball by repeated draws. So this is a special case because the distributions are masses are proportional to 1 over k. So it's zero, 0, 1 over k, 2 over k, right? Of course, you can implement whatever would have did with Chebyshev, right? So it, it's going to work. But the question is, can you do better? And the answer is actually yes. Because why? Because uh, recall this picture. This is what we're doing. We're, we're, we're approximating this stack function. And we know there is no mass here. There is one mass probably here. And the other things are here, right? If you, in the species problem, actually you know the, the masses are discrete. So there is no mass actually in between. You only have 1 over k, 2 over k. 
So you can design some interpolating polynomials and pass through all these points, and you will have exactly zero bias. So instead of uniform protection over all these masses, you can take advantage of this structure and do better. So in this case, you kill the square root of k uh, in some regime. By, uh, OK, so I'll not. So, uh, OK, so for entropy, I think Gentile will talk about this. You have similar result, but here uh, you have to do some sample splitting and uh, approximately different function. Uh, right, so OK, I want to stop here and uh, just say that in the general case, what you can say is essentially is governed by this following convex programming, where you have essentially a logarithmic number of constraint. And if you solve it, you can say a lot about the statistical limit. And uh, the thing I want to, the main message I want to say is the primal program of this give you impossibility result, give you converse. The dual of this give you a procedure that you can, you can extract from the dual. So, but I do not have time to go into this. Uh, OK, I'll just stop here. There are two preprints. And this one will appear, I don't know when, but depend on the mood of archive. So, <laughs> stop here. Thank you. Right, we have time for one question. Yeah, for chip shift polynomial, uh, what's the degree? Where do you need to truncate? Uh, first of all, I never truncate. truncate. Uh, the degree is log, is, is log in the, in the sample size, let's say. Please. Yeah. So I find the restriction on dk so that all of the non-zero probability entries are more than one over k probability. Uh -huh. A bit unrealistic in the sense if you look, for example, on Hamlet, there's probably like one very difficult word that appears somewhere in Hamlet that just appears once, right? Right. Yeah. So you know, you could say, okay, I, I I don't want to estimate exactly the support. I want to estimate, let's say, yes. um, the number of points that make up, let's say, the bulk of the distribution, or you know, I want to estimate all of them. You can do that. Of course, yeah, you can do that. You can essentially say something about the, 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 the I'm other happy. statistics about that. Yeah. Okay, because I'm happy to make a cutoff at 1 over k. I only care about things that have probably more than 1 over k. But to assume that there's nothing no Actually, bad. that is actually no. That, that is actually is not solvable. I can give you examples where it's, it's, I, I thought, you know, I only care about the sum of the big guys, right, the heavy hitters. But uh, no, that problem is actually ill defined. I can show you that. Yes. So, I mean, uh, regarding the, uh, the metric, the way you're measuring the error, there are two things. Right? One is, is uh, looking at the number of non zeros. So, what it means is the range is the probabilities of uh, them being sort of showing up as a part of the distribution. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, that's more, uh, yeah, what alone um, do with probability of the unseen, right? So, the, um, first of all, that's a random quantity. So, it depends on your sample. Uh, you can estimate its mean by this type of procedures, uh, but yeah, in, in general, I, I don't. I mean, differently, you're still estimating the support. Okay. However, uh, the error I'm going to read, so if, let's say, alphabet x, I've not seen it, then I will get a penalty which is you know, proportional to the probability distribution. Oh, okay. So small masses will cause less loss. By design. Yeah, okay, I never thought, but yeah. Thank you. Okay. Do you need this one?